Um, my name is Iman Ali, and I am so honored and privileged to be the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, I want to take just a brief minute to share with you our mission here at MPAC. I think the past few weeks have been so turbulent and uncertain um, in, in, in many ways. Um, and we hope that the time that you spend with us, whether it's in webinars, whether it's through our programs and fellowships, uh, our newsletters, our, our social media, you find, um, you find focus and you find meaning. And you know, that meaning and that mission um, is really that we, we hope to provide a public understanding of policies which impact American Muslims, be it through engaging with our government, um, media, and communities. And so if you feel that this mission fits your purpose in life, reach out to our team, you know, hello at impact.org. And we can find some ways for you to be involved, whether you know, it's through, as I mentioned, our programming and fellowship, through our community engagement, being, becoming even a donor. There are so many ways to help and bolster our mission, and we would love for you to be a part of that. Um, but I'm going to dive right in because we have an absolutely amazing, amazing webinar and guest with us here today, Ms. Rana Abdelhamid, um, who is the executive director of um, Malika. Um, so Rana, uh, I'm going to give just a brief um, introduction of you um, and then we can uh, jump right in. So when we were developing the, the theme of our webinar, we, we thought about how home, you know, at times can be a dangerous place, um, even in normal times, but especially when times aren't normal. And so so many names were thrown out, but a name that just kept popping up into everyone's mouth was uh, Rana's name um, and with her organization, Malika. And so um, Rana has a amazing, amazing history and, and work when it comes to um, communities specifically around migrant and gender and racial justice. Um, for 10 years, Rana has served as the executive director of Malika, um, which for those who don't know, um, is a global grassroots movement, which is committed to building safety and power for all women through self-defense healing, justice, and community organizing. Um, and she also has a wonderful aspect of financial literacy too, I believe. Um, so um, Rana's story is amazing because she founded Malika at the age of 16 after being attacked by a stranger who tried to remove the hijab from her head. Um, today, Rana and her volunteer team of women conduct healing spaces and have trained more than 20,000 women in 19 cities across the globe. Wow. So for the past three years, Malika has held the National Muslim Women's Summit at Harvard University, training 50 Muslim American women in leadership and community organizing. Um, I hope that you speak a bit about that, um, Rana, but right now I'm going to let our president, um, Salam al Mariyadi, go on with the question and answer, and then hopefully we'll tie back in with a few questions from the chat. For our viewers today, um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, you can type those in in the link below. It says Q&A and your questions will be anonymous. So um, don't worry about that, that aspect of, so feel free to ask whatever you would, you would like. Um, and thank you again. So off to you, Salam. Thank you, man. Thank you for your leadership in producing these wonderful webinars that have been very informative to our community and also helping MPAC connect more to community to shape our policy programming uh, that serves the best interests uh, of, uh, of, of Islam and Muslims. Uh, Rana, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you really, so much for having me. <laughs> we're, we're really indebted to you for your work, uh, for helping the powerless and, and uh, victims of domestic violence. So we heard a little bit about how it, you had a personal experience. Can you share with us more of your experience from that incident where somebody had uh, pulled your hijab off into the time that you actually started this organization. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, my name is Rana. I'm from Queens, New York. If anyone um, knows anything about Queens, it's a very immigrant working class borough of New York City. Um, and I grew up here in Queens in a post 9-11 context and I actually at the time I was volunteering at a domestic violence organization called Turning Point which I'll talk a little bit about in, more in a bit and I was assaulted as I was walking down the street by a man who basically was trying to remove my hijab um, and was saying really horrifying things to me about my religious identity and at the time I was very young um, and it was like the it was the first time in my life where I felt 
really unsafe in my own skin walking down the streets of my own city. And I was really shook to my core um, in that moment, but also then to learn that hate crimes against Muslims was a common thing that was happening at the time, hate crimes against Muslims had increased up to 1600%, 1600% after 9-11. Um, and as we all know, it's still an issue today. Um, and so the idea and the vision for Medica came really not as an organization, but as a way for my own healing process, where I got all of my friends together um, and I started teaching them karate at the time. So I had a, I had a black belt in Shotokan karate, which is why I was able to get away from that situation. Um, and so I started teaching karate. And then after the karate class, we would kind of sit around and talk about our experiences. Um, and that's kind of how the mo our model for change began to unfold, kind of seeing the ways in which immigrant women in my own neighborhood would come together um, and modeling that. And over time, Medica has evolved, obviously, into more intentionally being a grassroots initiative that really looks at how do we build power and safety for women across the globe through our four main programs. Oh, I think you're muted. All right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, your organization has been a keystone in empowering many women. Can you share with us uh, a bit of the programming that you've developed over the years to keep women safe, prepared, and independently strong? Yeah, for 100%. So we start from the space and the understanding that many women in our community already hold a lot of power and are organizers naturally and have upheld our communities in many ways, as we all know. Um, and in particular, women of color, Muslim women, women who have not necessarily been uplifted in various feminist spaces are the women who've been the backbone of many feminist um, and women's rights movements across the globe. And so our model for change is deeply rooted in our four trainings. Um, the first is, is a series of self-defense trainings that we conduct. Um, we have a train the trainer model where we train women to train other women in their communities um, in self-defense and our self-defense pedagogy is focused on de-escalation around hate crimes and gender-based violence. Um, our second pillar and our second program is healing justice, which is a peer-to-peer -peer led psychosocial support model where women come together and talk through their situations um, with different forms of violence. And actually this is one of the most effective interventions for domestic violence. Women feel a lot more safe and ready to start to deconstruct their own experiences when they're in a space where they recognize that they're not alone and they begin to understand what are the signs of domestic violence and gendered violence. The third is actually um, financial literacy. So recognizing that a lot of the reasons for why women decide to stay or are forced to stay in situations of gendered violence have to do with their financial standing. Um, we do financial literacy trainings for women of color um, so that we have a better hold and understanding of our financial situation. And last, we do organizing training. So our organizing training is rooted in the idea that we shouldn't have to learn any of these things. We shouldn't have to learn self-defense. We shouldn't have to be worried about our safety. And the only way you all probably know this is policy, policy heads and policy makers. Um, the only way to be able to change this is through institutional change. And we need organizers who understand policy, who understand governance, and understand how institutional change happens to actually make cultural and, and, gov and governance change at a very local level. And so we have boot camps where we train women in organizing. Um, we have one-off trainings, and we have summits that we host, both in the US and across the globe. Well, what about the males, the, the men of our community have you gotten support from the imams in endorsing your program and providing a uh, theological uh, foundation for it? Have you, uh, do you train men on how to uh, also um, work to protect uh, our sisters when we're going out, uh, especially young men who need that kind of training, you know, and simple etiquette? Uh, is there any kind of programming with them as well? Yeah, so actually I always start, I didn't say this part of my story, but I always start my story with when I first started, <laughs> my local imam was not too fond of <laughs> this initiative, kind of like a 16 year old girl being like, I want to train people in self-defense, especially during that time. Um, but over, over time, right, 
we as an organization have realized that we cannot, I mean, oftentimes, right, like the gatekeepers in our community happen to be imams who are men um, in the context of our, of our community spaces. And so we do have to work with imams when we're working in mosques and community spaces, and many of them are very, um, very much supportive of our programming in various ways. I think obviously there, us as an organization that is very progressive, as there is ways in which we have to negotiate how we show up in, in various spaces. Um, so there's that, right, which is an ongoing conversation, an ongoing kind of way in which we try to bring along the elders in our community. Um, and then there's, to answer your, the other part of your question, we have a masculinity engagement program, which is led by Muslim men actually here in New York City. And it's really amazing because the majority of our leadership is kind of women focused on women's programs. And they took our healing justice curriculum and kind of turned it into their own. Um, and they hold spaces mostly for young professional Muslim men and talk about, you know, how can Muslim men be allies and show up. And it's, it's been really beautiful. I think another program that we've seen a lot of men show up to is our bystander intervention training. So men trying to better understand how they could use um, their own privilege as they show up in different spaces in public um, to make sure that they're being great allies for Muslim women. Melika means queen, and I'm not sure if that's you chose that because you're from Queens or <laughs> or uh, there's a double meaning to it. Uh, the men would be Malik, but angels mean is, is Malaika. So maybe the men and women can both be Malaika for each other. We hope so. We hope so. Um, how has uh, COVID-19 impacted shelters? Like here in Los Angeles, we have uh, Niswa, which is a women's shelter who are uh, victims of domestic violence. Um, how have they been impacted? Well, um, there are many ways in which shelters have been impacted. If anyone knows or has been in, into a, in a shelter space, there are communal spaces. Um, shelters are very crowded. So when we talk about, uh, like the news media right now is talking a lot about prisons, right? And talking a lot about detention as a space where Corona and COVID could spread really rapidly. And I think shelters are another hot spot where that could happen, right? Because they're very confined. Um, a lot of folks who run shelters now have to re-strategize and think about how they have to space out and think through how they need to reuse and repurpose space to make sure that one, women and children who are in those spaces are safe, um, but also knowing that that means there's going to be less space, right, for folks to use. And so what are the alternative spaces that need to be used, like hotels um, uh, or additional community spaces to continue to shelter folks? So from that perspective, shelters um, are becoming more and more strained and are needing more resources to be able to function and be safe spaces for women. Um, I think also there is a lack of probably misinformation and also a lack of accessibility to if shelters are still running, if they're still accepting folks, um, also women knowing that they could actually go out and, and be able to like leave the situation um, and making sure that folks understand that shelters are still up and running, um, that resource is still out there, but also that they should be fundraising and donating for shelters um, is really critical. And how do you get support? Um, uh, how do you how do you sustain this program is from the community or from public funding or any grants? As Malika? Yes. So we're we're a mixed we have a mixed revenue model. Um, we do a lot of private partnerships with universities and private sector institutions that help fund um, programs that bring out women of color for free to our programs. Um, we very intentionally also work with corporate organizations as well that might we charge higher for those programs that then subsidize our programs in community where communities don't pay anything but we also rely on grants um, and the most important thing is a lot of our team um, is volunteer based and I think this is something that we are trying to be more intentional about as an organization that is led by brown and black women to kind of be like you know it's really important for us to fund the women in our community for their labor. Um, so we're always looking for funding opportunities, donors, grants, foundations, and things of this sort. 
uh, back to the community, do you, do you uh, ever find a situation where men use Islam to justify domestic violence? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, yes, right? I think there's a lot of opportunity for us in the community to really, one, uplift Muslim women's scholarship because it exists, right? Um, and for us to push against the ways in which Islamic interpretation can be used in a violent way and can be used to justify violence. And I'm pretty sure folks know that there are certain verses that are oftentimes cherry picked in a very isolated way without context and interpreted in a way that could be silencing to women um, and push women out of spaces of leadership. So from an Islamic interpretation perspective, we do see that unfortunately, um, but we also see on the flip side, Imams who are pushing against this um, as well, who want to be very vocal allies. I think on a, on, a, on a structural level as well, which is something that's really deeply important to us, is how women are given or are allowed to be in spaces of power within Islamic institutions. So looking at the boards of our mosques, how many, are, how many board members are women? Looking at the boards of Islamic schools and Islamic institutions, how many of them are women, the leadership at various levels of our organizations, that's important as, as is that interpretation. Yeah, and if, if, uh, if it's helpful, we have a paper called Abusing Women, Abusing Islam. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's ever helpful, you know, for your groups to uh, have that discourse, please uh, go ahead and use it. Um, Thanks, yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen it before in my work. Okay, good. Yeah. And let us know what else we can do from a, uh, from a programmatic side or from a um, um, providing that perspective. For sure. Uh, Gro Governor Cuomo said there's a 15% uptick of domestic violence. So uh, since the COVID-19 crisis and the response, um, what resources are available to women who are victims of domestic violence at this time? Yeah, so if you look at New York State specifically, and I could, I could also speak in general and speak about some recommendations that are happening across the globe that I think the U.S. needs to catch up to as well. Um, in New York State, one thing very specifically that they've done is they've extended orders of protection. So it's important for women to know that your orders of protection have been extended. And if you are going about, you should just have it on you at all times um, in case it is requested, in case you need it at some point. Um, I know there's also efforts on local levels to fund and support um, shelters and to ensure that women do have access um, to safe spaces if they need it. The, I just got an alert actually right before this of a list of resources um, that the state just sent out in terms of like hotlines and the mental health um, resources that they just, they had 6,000 volunteers kind of be on, a, on call. Um, however, I do know that in addition to the to these resources that do exist, right, there are a ton of other things that could be done. So um, I think a really great model and a really great example of a state that is taking this to heart and ensuring that women are safe is France right now. Um, they just passed um, in their in their kind of bill to make sure that folks are staying at home. They just passed a commitment of 1.1 million dollars just going to domestic violence survivors and victims. They're ensuring that there are 20,000 hotels um, that are available for domestic violence survivors and victims. Um, and so things like this, homes, shelter, right, funding for organizations so they're not tapped out um, is important. And then also kind of making sure that there is not misinformation that's out there around what's what is shutting down and what's not like courts are still working right these are still essential workers um is important for folks to know so it's good that france is is doing that what about the united states our congress and the state legislatures what are they doing and what can we as mpac and other um, muslim organizations do to advocate uh for our governments to take domestic violence seriously and to provide uh the the the, the funding and the programming um, for organizations like you to deliver these services? I know that 25 senators have, they wrote a letter kind of to do an exploration around the impact of um, domestic violence, COVID-19 on domestic violence 
islands, kind of trying to explore more what are the resources that need to be put up um, to support organizations. But we know that, you know, there have historically been cuts in a lot of the funding around violence against women. Um, and so putting more pressure on our congressional members, on our senators, um, doing things that are also online and offline to support shelters, community-based organizations, but also to really create conversation around this being important. I know in China, for example, there was a hashtag that went viral in China that was kind of making sure that folks are aware that at home is not safe for everyone. Um, and we have yet to see that type of momentum take place in the United States. Um, we know that the inequality happens at many levels in the US on racial lines, as well as on gender on, you know, on, on and I think like, sometimes that could be um, lost in the midst of all the other things that are going on. Can you provide the, the hotline number and, and other uh, website information that people can connect to to get more information about your organization? Yeah, I can. Um, would it be best if I just sent it to Iman afterwards? So you can you can say it now and and uh, and then send it to us uh, afterwards. It's okay, good to cool. So if folks are interested in learning more about Melika, um, they're they're welcome to go to www.malikah.org or follow us on Instagram on social. Um, at we are M A L I K A H, which is we are Melika. Um, and just so folks know, the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, is 800 799 7233. Uh, and I know that, you know, a lot of these hotlines are saying that there's actually been a decrease in the number of callers, which is very surprising. And many of it is because if you're at home and you're isolated, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to make a call. And there's a texting option as well. So it's important for folks to know that, or if they can ask a friend to call on their behalf um, is also an option. Wonderful, uh, Iman, uh, it's your turn to give us the questions from our audience. Of course. Well, first of all, let me just say, wow, Rana, uh, this has been so, so informative. And thank you again for, for joining us. Um, for our viewers, if, if any of you have, you know, daughters, sisters, anyone really, I, I really encourage you to follow Malika's social media because I know I'm posting on my story every day because there's so much information and so much um, uh, uh exciting stuff that that goes on there. So please, please, please follow them. Um, we have a ton of questions. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, we have a question that says, you know, in this time of stay at home orders, how can people reach out for support when they may be living with the abuser day and night? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and I and I hear that question. And I also like send, you know, my, my deepest regards for that question, because a lot of women are in this situation right now and more and more women will be unable to actually find the help that they need because they are isolated because they don't have even the space to make a phone call. Um, and so options that the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, provides or New Horizon provides, or safe, sorry, Safe Horizons provides where you can actually text, where you could be online and they, they've worked out their tech, so it's not in your history if you're actually looking this up. Um, if you're chatting on the site and someone walks in, and you, it makes it very easy for you to close the browser. Um, and so there's really technologically updated ways for women to be able to make these calls if they need to. If it's very difficult for you directly to, to do this because you're really being watched, if there is a moment where you could ask a friend um, to actually make the call on your behalf, that becomes really important. A lot globally right now, what we're seeing is folks are using code words. And I know that this was passed in the piece of legislation in France um, where people are asking for mask 19. They walk into a pharmacy and if they say mask 19, then the pharmacist knows that this is a domestic violence case and this person needs support. Um, I think we need more of that in the United States to be orchestrated amongst community-based organizations and amongst friends, groups of friends, um, so that there is kind of this opportunity to create 
um, support in an anonymous way, in a safe way, especially during this context of isolation. Wonderful. And so uh, with this kind of um, new time that we're in, where a lot of our work is being done from, you know, an electronic tele kind of work, I know that many of the wonderful uh, organizations like Malika are doing things, you know, virtually. And, and I want to ask, you know, for those who might not have immediate access to internet or can't just jump on a webinar, what are means, um, how as I as a friend or an ally or a sister help these kinds of individuals? Are there previous recorded um, situations? Are there graphics that we can share? Any insight would be really great. Yeah, for sure. So definitely on the Melika page, we have a couple of graphics. I know Safe Horizons has graphics. The National Domestic Violence um, Hotline also has graphics. Those are three organizations I would take a look at. Melika, we just put out a graphic on like, what do you do if you are in a situation of domestic violence and isolated with your abuser? What if you do if home is not safe? Um, what do you do if your home is not safe? And that's a graphic that could be shared around and easily printable. Um, I would say that it's up to folks who are not directly impacted, who are not in these situations, and who do have space to actually be allies, to check in on folks, um, and to really extend their hand. Like this is the time to, if you know of someone who has had a history of domestic violence in their life, who you know might be isolated with their abuser, then consistent follow through, um, making sure that they kind of have the tools and need, making sure that they know that there might be options for an ex exit plan is really important because you don't know how a situation might escalate. Um, okay. And so calling, texting, knocking on the, like we're, we're doing our best. Um, even taking a walk from socially distant way, mm -hmm. um, is something that could really be helpful and create some breathing room for someone. Absolutely. So I know from, from my end, just listening to you speak, it's such an inspiration. Um, and, and I want to make a small pitch for, for MPAC here is that we have a wonderful program called the Congressional Leadership Development Program. Um, and I hope that, I hope you've heard of it, Rana, but in case you haven't, you know, we handpick um, Muslim leaders from all over the United States, young, young leaders, um, and we help them receive a congressional internship um, on Capitol Hill, which is super exciting um, for us because it's often underrepresented and underserved communities that get to come um, to the Hill. And something that in my time working with these young leaders, I've, I've been told that, you know, all of them, nearly all of them go out and make a very bold impact when they go back to their communities. Um, and, you know, I ask them, what is it that, you know, really helped frame you know, your purpose or, or what your cause really is. And they say, hearing from current leaders, hearing from current inspirations. And I think I can speak for, for all of our attendees and, and people here at Unpack to say that you truly are a, an inspiration. Um, and so I want to know what is the advice or guidance that you want to give, you know, the future congressmen and congresswomen and public servants and Muslim leaders, um, any, any insight would be great in that regard. Um, first of all, that's a really awesome program, and I've heard of it, and I think it's amazing. So thanks for the work that you do. Um, I think in terms of what has been the best advice that I've received that I oftentimes give to other women that I work with is just staying connected to your community. Um, from Queens, kind of being, having the opportunity to go to places like DC and, you know, travel in, in various contexts and attend these various institutions that sometimes could feel very removed from my community and oftentimes um, have historically maybe done harm to my community. It was, re it's always refreshing from a mental health standpoint to come home and to be connected and to stay connected to community-based organizations, but also from a leadership standpoint, right? Um, being connected to communities where that are directly impacted Muslim communities, communities of color, when we are in spaces where we're the only one um, is the most important because that's your ears to the ground, knowing exactly what you should be doing and how you should be leading and what voice you need to be bringing back into your space, into the spaces of power that we then begin to occupy. Um, and so that, that has been kind of the most important thing for me um, in my own journey for leadership and in leadership and in these spaces. And that's kind of the piece of advice that I would give. Um, the one last thing I'd add, I'll as a, oh, sorry, do you wanna? 
No, no, go ahead and finish. I was just going to plug in that this Saturday is, is Melika's virtual National Muslim Women Summit. So it's the first time we're hosting it online. And it's similar in the sense that we're, we're um, getting all these really incredible Muslim women organizers who will be speaking to Muslim women from across the country. We have about 180 women signed up for this Saturday. Um, and so we're, we're super excited about it. And if anyone's interested, the application's due tomorrow, I think. So there's still time. Uh, we had a, a person who was asking questions about this, uh, this particular webinar that you're on. And I think it's a problem that you find in many religious communities that people, uh, where people are exploiting both the Quran and the Bible to uh, justify the exploitation uh, of women and violence against them. How do you respond to both people who, who do that and people that point a finger at religion for sanctioning that? I think um, there's a couple of things. One is I'll speak to it from my personal journey because as a young Muslim woman, as someone who is deeply religious and spiritual, um, I've grappled with a lot of that because I've kind of been embedded in, in spaces that are religious that oftentimes would be contrary to kind of my own value system. And in doing my own exploration and doing my own reading and, and really finding a diversity of various perspectives and scholars, I found that there is a lot of manipulation, right? And it's under the guise and it, under the guise of religion, but the reality is it's patriarchy and patriarchy is embedded in all systems in religion and in institutions, right? And in economic, mm -hmm. academic, at every level of our society, we see patriarchy manifest because it's a system of power. Um, and in the only way we're going to be able to rid ourselves of this patriarchy is when we really interrogate um, and push against interpretations that are violent. And I think for me, what's really important is to be able to do and recognize that I have agency as a Muslim woman, as a young Muslim woman, to do my own research, to understand how my faith works for me and works for my community and empowers me and women around me, um, and to be able to then kind of use use that understanding to stifle um, and kind of zone out those interpretations that are violent because they have real implications um, in the ways in which a lot of Muslim women experience their religion in unfortunately violent ways. So it's kind of up to us. It's a responsibility of leaders. And I'm glad organizations like yours exist to kind of also do this work. Thank you. And to the person that was asking the question, he sounds like a troll, but I think we have to answer him anyway, because uh, okay. and I'm not even sure if this is his real name, Christopher Logan, whoever that is. Uh, number one, you, you are not a sheikh and you obviously don't know Arabic. So the verses that you are citing, uh, you're taking out of context. I'm sure you got it. You're parroting what other uh, Islamophobes are putting out there in social media, uh, but enjoy. Uh, we, we, we really don't care what you think. We, we care more about the people who are concerned about humanity, concerned about how religion plays a positive con a constructive role in humanity, be they Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist. Um, we're all here to help the human family. Uh, so if you have any constructive questions, We'd be happy to answer them. The verses that you cited were talking about how God has a truth and people have different interpretations of the truth, but he includes all of them. And he only has one religion. It is the religion where we're all submitting to God, whether you're Christian, Jew, uh, uh, Mormon, or any religion for that matter, uh, we're all submitting to God. That who is, that's who he is referring to. So uh, thank you for the question. And uh, we'll call out uh, anyone else uh, who continues to troll us, but uh, no, we, we don't mind having the discourse. Rana, I would like to say that this is a, you know, welcome to the family kind of thing. Once you become a part of the MPAC family, we're here to stand strong with you. So 
I had even dismissed the questions, but I'm glad that Salam brought them up because absolutely, you know, I think one of the big points that um, people who often don't understand the, the purpose of solidarity and community building is that why are you hand picking, cherry picking certain organizations, certain races, certain genders to bolster? And if you could speak a little bit about why it is important to bolster the vulnerable um, or, or the often historically oppressed or ignored, why that, you know, isn't, quote unquote, racist or sexist, why it's very simply put important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the North Star of Melika as, a, as an organization is that we reject the notion that uh, we reject notions of like of white feminism, right? And we know that kind of feminist movements historically have silenced, have colonized, have been used to further colonization, have been used to further kind of these white supremacists, Christian supremacists, ideologies that we confront and for us it's about how do we actually truly be an inclusive organization a just organization and to do that it's about centering voices that are the most impacted because those are the voices that we will be able to kind of lead with um, and know that we're going to do the work most effectively and i think the covid 19 reality um, is such a great example of this like the map that came out last week, I don't know if anyone's following, that kind of, you know, had zip codes of various parts of New York City and then how many people tested positive shows why it's so important for us to lead with the most vulnerable because we see that those who are most impacted are the most vulnerable. And so policies that center working class people, that center um, immigrant communities, that center communities of color are going to be policies that will help us defeat COVID-19. Um, just like I think policies that center the most marginalized women are going to be policies that will help us defeat sexism and patriarchy um, in the very same way. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rana. Uh, we're very proud and admirable of your work. And we actually hope that you can speak to our young leaders in the future. We, we can add you into our curriculum and uh, want to remain engaged with you and your organization as partners. Yeah, I would love that. I'm super excited to get to know more about your work on this call, too. It's been really delightful. Thank you. Iman, um, go ahead. Sure thing. Yeah, again, thank you, Rana. And so um, I want to make just a bit of a, of a plug in for some of the work that MPAC is doing for our viewers. So, um, you know, as many of you know, MPAC's work is really heavy in both the Hollywood side of things and the policy realm. Um, but with the rise of COVID-19, our office has been knee deep in both policy, um, which ensures the protections of Muslim Americans, as well as a lot of coalition um, work with our communities. Um, but today, you know, rather than highlighting some of our policy work, I want to bring up a new project our digital team, our wonderful, wonderful digital team is working on. Um, and I think it comes around this word of hero and shiro, right? So we recognize that in this time, the word hero and shiro is one that requires a higher standard than normal, right? So every day there are thousands of healthcare workers and community leaders and organizers who are definitely putting their life on the line to serve and protect us from this pandemic. Um, and so when we were thinking about how to highlight these individuals, we at MPAC became very determined um, to be a part of uplifting and sharing their stories. And so we really urge you to keep an eye out on our social media in the next coming weeks um, to see, you know, the stories of both those currently serving and the fallen um, so that we can pay, you know, our proper respect and, and gain a very vital insight into the hard work that healthcare professionals are doing during this time. Um, Another thing, if you know someone who is a hero or shiro at this time, please, please DM our Instagram at MPAC National, um, and we will be happy to, to correspond with you and get those people properly highlighted. Um, and then finally, you know, if you enjoyed this webinar, which I'm sure 110% of us did, um, please, please join us for our next webinar, which is Friday at 2 o'clock. Um, Pacific time and five o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which I have to plug that because I'm the Eastern Standard it's Time. Really I always have to do the math on that. Um, but our webinar is going to be with the CEO of the Red Cross LA, Jarrett Berrios. Um, and for any more information about our upcoming webinars, please uh, go to mpac.org slash forward slash webinars. Um, and then just a final pitch, you know, it's been such a pleasure having you, Rana, and, and these webinars are such a vital part of us 
becoming and staying engaged with with our community. We can't, you know, be um, in rooms with you guys right now, but trust us that your support, be it, you know, financially, through social media, attendance of our programming, um, it really keeps our team motivated and able to serve. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, please stay safe and please join us for future webinars. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you. Thank you, man. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Um.